This is big, really. I'm not just trying to entice you to watch my video or supply you with clickbait titles and headlines. This news came in roughly four days ago. I stumbled across it on my Facebook feed and for me anyway, it was truly a what the F moment. There are two main points here. One, the fact that a discovery of this magnitude has been made and two, it is unlike any other on Earth. If you're new here, welcome. My name is Carmen, and I like to dive into the abyss of those what-the-f moments in our universe, be it phenomena, nature anomalies, strange science, or just plain weird behavior. Welcome to my channel. First, let's take a deeper look at the tree of life. In biology, the tree of life or universal tree of life is a metaphor, model and research tool used to explore the evolution of life and describe the relationships between organisms, both living and extinct, as described in a famous passage in Charles Darwin's On the Origin of Species, 1859. The Tree of Life shows how all life on Earth is related. Each leaf represents a different species. The branches show how these many species evolved from common ancestors over billions of years. In this interactive Tree of Life from OneZoom.org, you can explore the relationships between 2,235,076 species. Charles Darwin said this in 1859, the affinities of all the beings of the same class have sometimes been represented by a great tree. I believe this simile largely speaks the truth. The green and budding twigs may represent existing species, and those produced during each former year may represent the long succession of extinct species. At each period of growth, all the growing twigs have tried to branch out on all sides and to overtop and kill the surrounding twigs and branches. In the same manner as species and groups of species have tried to overmaster other species in the great battle for life. The limbs divided into great branches and these into lesser and lesser branches were themselves once, when the tree was small, budding twigs and this connection of the former and present buds by ramifying branches may well represent the classification of all extinct and living species in groups subordinate to groups. Of the many twigs which flourished when the tree was a mere bush, only two or three, now grown into great branches, yet survive and bear all the other branches. So with the species which lived during long past geological periods, very few now have living and modified descendants. From the first growth of the tree, 
many a limb and branch has decayed and dropped off. And these lost branches of various sizes may represent those whole orders, families and genera which have now no living representatives and which are known to us only from having been found in a fossil state. As we here and there see a thin straggling branch springing from a fork low down in a tree and which by some chance has been favoured and is still alive on its summit, so we occasionally see an animal like the platypus or South American lungfish, which in some small degree connects by its affinities to large branches of life and which has apparently been saved from fatal competition by having inhabited a protected station or an ecological niche. As buds give rise by growth to fresh buds, and these, if vigorous, branch out and overtop on all sides many a feebler branch, so by generation I believe it has been with the great tree of life, which fills with its dead and broken branches the crust of the earth and covers the surface with its ever-branching and beautiful ramifications. Tree diagrams originated in the medieval era to represent genealogical relationships. Phylogenetic tree diagrams in the evolutionary sense date back to the mid-19th century. The term phylogeny for the evolutionary relationships of species through time was coined by Ernst Haeckel, who went further than Darwin in proposing phylogenic histories of life. In contemporary usage, tree of life refers to the compilation of comprehensive phylogenetic databases rooted at the last universal common ancestor of life on Earth. Here's the thing. New species are being discovered every day and added to the tree of life. We know that. There is nothing new there. Spectacular? Yes, but nothing new. But this is not just a new species to be added to the list. The article from newatlas.com that I saw had this as its headline. Scientists have discovered a completely new branch on the tree of life. This supergroup contains an incredibly diverse range of predatory microbes that are extremely different genetically from any other form of life on Earth, and it was always there. We just never noticed it. The Tree of Life is a useful diagram for understanding the relationship between different forms of life, present and extinct. The trunks are made up of three broad groups called domains, the highest category of life, bacteria, archaea, and eukaryota, which then branch into kingdoms such as animals and fungi. So the animal kingdom would be a twig growing from one of the boughs called domains, specifically the eukaryota domain. From there, the branches become more and more specific until you reach individual species. This new discovery, however, adds quite a major branch to the tree and in effect changes it on the second level. Quote, sitting under domains and above kingdoms are branches of creatures 
that biologists have taken to calling supergroups, unquote. About five to seven have been found, with the most recent in 2022, and before that in 2018. The second level of the Tree of Life is the Kingdom level, and this is where they have inserted this newly discovered life form. This is an ancient branch of the Tree of Life that is roughly as diverse as the animal and fungi kingdoms combined, and no one knew it was there. And this is the what the F moment, at least one of them. Provora is a proposed supergroup of eukaryotes made up of predatory microbes. The supergroup is further divided into two clades. The nibblerids, which use tooth-like structures to nibble chunks of their prey, and the nebulids, which engulf their prey whole. This supergroup has created a new ancient branch on the Tree of Life. Members of the Provora supergroup are tiny organisms, predatory microbes, that the team or the scientists describes as the lions of the microbial world. That's because they prey upon other microbes and within their ecosystem, they're relatively rare. It was reported that 10 strains were isolated and cultured in 2022. The team discovered this new kind of life in samples taken from around the world, including the coral reefs in Curaçao, sediment from the Black and Red Seas, and water from the Pacific and Arctic Oceans. The researchers' attention was drawn to strange microbes with two flagella or tails, allowing them to spin or swim very quickly. They also had a tendency to quickly gobble up any other microbes unfortunate enough to be kept in the same water samples. When the scientists examined their DNA more closely, it became clear just how weird these new microbes really were. In the taxonomy of living organisms, we often use the gene 18S RRNA to describe genetic difference, said Dr. Dennis Tikhonenkov, first author of the study and senior researcher at the Institute for Biology of Inland Waters of the Russian Academy of Sciences. For example, humans differ from guinea pigs in this gene by only six nucleotides. We were surprised to find that these predatory microbes differ by 170 to 180 nucleotides in the 18S rRNA gene from any other living thing on Earth. It became clear that we had discovered something completely new and amazing. So their 18S is so different to that of other eukaryotes that they were taxonomically placed in a separate supergroup, a species like no other on Earth. So I looked at the original study and unfortunately it is behind a paywall. It's in nature.com so if any of you out there subscribe to nature.com and are interested in reading this please please leave a comment below and let me know what you think you can also find loads of material here if you want to dive in deeper i will leave the link below but here is an excerpt molecular phylogenetics 
of microbial eukaryotes has reshaped the tree of life by establishing broad taxonomic divisions termed supergroups that supersede the traditional kingdoms of animals, fungi and plants and encompass a much greater breadth of eukaryotic diversity. The vast majority of newly discovered species fall into a small number of known supergroups. Recently, however, a handful of species with no clear relationship to other supergroups have been described, raising questions about the nature and degree of undiscovered diversity and exposing the limitations of strictly molecular-based exploration. Here, we report 10 previously undescribed strains of microbial predators isolated through culture that collectively form a diverse new supergroup of eukaryotes termed Provora. The Provora supergroup is genetically, morphologically and behaviorally distinct from other eukaryotes and comprises two divergent clades of predators. There's those funny names again. Nebulidia and Nibleridia that are superficially similar to each other but differ fundamentally in ultrastructure, behavior and gene content. These predators are globally distributed in marine and freshwater environments but are numerically rare and have consequently been overlooked by molecular diversity surveys. In the age of high throughput analyses, investigation of eukaryotic diversity through culture remains indispensable for the discovery of rare but ecologically and evolutionarily important eukaryotes. So up till now, I've only talked about what was most recently discovered and published only a few days ago. Let's backtrack a little to around 2018 because this goes further back. Around 2018, the Tree of Life got another major branch. Researchers found a certain rare and mysterious microbe called a hemimastigote in a clump of Nova Scotian soil. Their subsequent analysis, I will leave the link below of this, of its DNA revealed that it was neither animal, plant, fungus, nor any recognized type of protozoan that it in fact fell far outside any of the known large categories for classifying complex forms of life, eukaryotes. Instead, this flagella waving oddball stands as the first member of its own supra kingdom group, which probably peeled away from the other branches of life at least a billion years ago. It's the sort of result you hope to see once in a career, said Alistair Simpson, a microbiologist at Dalhousie University who led the study. Impressive as this finding about hemimastigotes is on its own, what matters more is that it's just the latest and most profound of a quietly and steadily growing number of major taxonomic additions. Researchers keep uncovering not just new species or classes, but entirely new kingdoms of life. Raising questions about how they have stayed hidden for so long and how close we are to finding them all. Okay, we're talking about kingdoms here. This is the second level 
on the tree of life. What is even more bizarre is that this particular species was discovered purely by accident by a Dalhousie graduate student, Jana Eglit, while hiking in Nova Scotia on a cold spring day in 2016. She fell back from her friends to scrape a few grams of dirt into a plastic tube. Such impromptu soil sampling, she said, is a professional hazard. Back in the lab, Eglit soaked her sample in water and over the next month, she periodically peeked at it through a microscope for signs of unusual life. Late one evening, something odd in the sample caught her eye. An elongated cell radiating whip-like flagella was, quote, awkwardly swimming as though it didn't realize it had all these flagella that could help it move, unquote, Eglit said. Under a more powerful scope, she saw it fit the description of a hemimastigoat, a rare kind of protist that was notoriously hard to cultivate. The next morning, the lab was abuzz with excitement over the opportunity to describe and sequence the specimen. We dropped everything, she recalled. Hemimastigotes represent one of a handful of Rumsfeldian known unknown protist lineages, moderately well-described groups whose positions on the tree of life are not precisely known because they are difficult to culture in a lab and sequence. Protistologists have used peculiarities of hemimastigote's structure to infer their close relatives, but their guesses were shotgunned all over the phylogeny. Without molecular data, lineages like hemimastigotes remain orphans of unknown ancestry. But a new method called single cell transcriptomics has revolutionized such studies. It enables researchers to sequence large numbers of genes from just one cell. Oh, that sounds a bit like Theranos to me. Gordon Lax, another graduate student in the Simpson lab and an expert on this method, explained that for hard to study organisms like hermimastigotes, single cell transcriptomics can produce genetic data of a quality previously reserved for more abundant cells, making deeper genomic comparisons finally possible. The team sequenced more than 300 genes and Laura Eam, now a postdoctoral researcher at Uppsala University, modeled how those genes evolved to infer a classification for hemimastigotes. We were fully expecting them to fall within one of the existing supergroups, she explained. Lab members were instead stunned to find that hemimastigotes fit nowhere on the tree. They represented their own distinct lineage apart from the other half dozen supergroups. To understand how evolutionarily distinct the hemimastigote lineage is, imagine the eukaryotic tree splayed out before you on the ground as a narrowing set of paths which begin with places for all living groups of eukaryotes near your toes and converge far in the distance at our common ancestor. Starting at our mammalian tip, walk down the path and back into history, past the fork where our lineage diverged from reptiles and birds, past the turnoffs for fishes 
for starfish and for insects and then further still, beyond the split that separates us from fungi. If you turn around and look back, all the diverse organisms you passed fall within just one of the six eukaryote supergroups. Hemimastigotes are still up ahead in a supergroup of their own, on a path that nothing else occupies. Scientists also think we have much more of the tree of life to uncover, largely because of how quickly it's changing. The tree of life is being reshaped by new data. It is really quite different than even what it was 15 or 20 years ago. We're seeing a tree with many more branches than we thought. Finding a lineage as distinct as hemimastigotes is still relatively rare. But if you go down a level or two on the hierarchy to the mere kingdom level, the one that encompasses, say, all animals, you find that new major lineages are popping up about once a year. That rate isn't slowing down. If anything, it might be speeding up. The availability of more capable sequencing technology, such as single cell transcriptomics, is part of what's driving this trend in eukaryotes, especially for known unknown groups. It empowers researchers to glean usable DNA from single specimens. But scientists caution that these methods still require the keen eye of skilled protistologists like Eglit so that we can actually target what we want to look at. Another kind of sequencing called metagenomics could accelerate discovery even further. Researchers can now venture into the field, grab a sample of dirt from the trail or a biofilm from a deep sea vent and sequence everything in the sample. The catch is that it's usually just a snippet of one gene. For bacteria and archaea, organisms in the two other domains of life distinct from eukaryotes, that's usually enough to work with. And metagenomics has been behind recent huge discoveries, such as the Asgard archaea, an enormous phylum of archaea totally unknown to science until about three years ago. But for eukaryotes, which tend to have larger and more complicated genomes, metagenomics is a troublesomely broad way to sample. It reveals many types of organisms that live in an environment. But unless you have a larger known reference sequence, it's very difficult to put these different things into an evolutionary framework. That's why most of the recent really deep eukaryotic lineages have been discovered the old-fashioned way. Through identifying a weird protist in the lab and targeting it for sequencing. But the two methods are complementary and inform one another. For example, it's now clear that hemimastigotes popped up in previously published metagenomic databases. Yet, we just had no way of recognizing them until we had longer hemimastigote sequences to compare them to. Metagenomics can point to potential hotspots of unknown diversity, and deeper sequencing can make metagenomic data more meaningful. The future is bright for researchers cataloging diversity in both ordinary and extraordinary environments. While metagenomic tools allow us to explore extreme environments like the sediment near hydrothermal vents where the Asgard Archaea was found, 
researchers can also find new lineages in their backyards. This whole new super kingdom lineage was discovered by a graduate student out on a hike who happened to collect some dirt. Imagine if we could scan every environment on Earth. As scientists continue to fill out the tree, the algorithms used to add branches will only get more efficient. This will help researchers resolve deeper, more ancient splits in the history of life. Our understanding of how life unfolded is still very much incomplete. Questions like how eukaryotes emerged or how photosynthesis evolved remain unanswered because we don't have a tree that is stable enough to pinpoint where these key events happened. Beyond answering such fundamental questions, the simple joy of discovery motivates researchers like Eglit. The microbial world is a wide open frontier, says Eglit. It's thrilling to explore what's out there. Before I finish this video, I just want to make a little side note about my research on this topic. It was a little confusing at first because, well, as is the nature of the internet, some articles and Wikipedia were conflicting. In the end, I decided to go with the original report from Nature, as this came directly from the scientists. There is a little confusion as to exactly where these life forms have been inserted on the tree of life. Maybe because it's still being debated, I don't know. Because they have been discovering new supergroups in the last 10 years or so, one thing they already had to consider doing was to move the root of the eukaryotic tree. From a PDF I found titled Evolution Rooting the Eukaryotic Tree of Life, it says this. The root of the eukaryotic tree is a major unresolved question in evolutionary biology. A recent study marshals mitochondrial genes to place that root between the enigmatic excavates and all other eukaryotes providing an interesting new perspective on early eukaryotic evolution. Eukaryotes are the group of organisms whose cells contain a mitochondrion and a nucleus. Although we often think of eukaryotes as comprising animals, plants, fungi and the single-celled protists, molecular phylogenetics has turned that view on its head. If you want to read this PDF, I've left the link below, as well as all other links relevant to this video. After all is said and done, it really doesn't matter where these life forms are placed on the tree of life, because what is most amazing here is that these are newly discovered life forms that are like nothing else on earth, yet they were always right under our noses. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to hit that like button. It really helps the channel get around those YouTube algorithms. Also consider subscribing so as not to miss any future uploads. This helps to support me and any work I put into these videos and also helps me put out future videos, right? You can also support me by subscribing to my Patreon which covers everything I do creatively. I'm also a songwriter and web designer, so there's lots there. In the meantime, stay healthy, stay safe, and I'll see you on my next video.